I want to ask you about something I asked weeks before the election when we sat down. Uh, you said you would absolutely serve eight years if elected. Do you plan to run for re-election? Yes. But look, I'm a great respecter of fate. Fate has intervened in my life many, many times. If I'm in the health I'm in now, if I'm in good health, then, in fact, I would run again. And if that means a rematch against Donald Trump? You're trying to tempt me now. <laughs> sure. Why would I not run against Donald Trump or the nominee? That would increase the prospect of running. President Biden speaking exclusively with World News Tonight anchor David Muir about his political future. <laughs> Let's dig into this more with our roundtable. Our political director, Rick Klein, deputy political director, Avery Harper, and senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. So, Rick, let me start with you. What did you make of that answer? A fascinating exchange, John. I think it opened the door into Joe Biden's thinking wider than he ever has in any previous setting. Uh, look, on the surface, he still says he's running for re-election, uh, and that, that is the answer he's been giving all along. But this is the first time that you heard him explicitly acknowledge there's a scenario where he doesn't, talking about his own health. And even the part about President Trump and the former president, the possibility that he runs again, for, for Biden to say that makes it more likely that he runs, that at least admits the possibility that he isn't running. And I think it, it also gets to Biden's attempt to shore up the base, because for a lot of Democrats who are skeptical about him uh, and his health, frankly, at this moment, they also know that he is the one man who beat Donald Trump. And that may be the most important uh, quality in a candidate in, in 2024 as well. Yeah, it was interesting. He has said that he plans to run before. He's, he's invoked the idea that fate could intervene. But that was a direct yes, but <laughs> answer. So, Avery, I, I got to say, when you think about that, this decision or the hands of fate, whatever it is, hangs over Democrats uh, in, in, a, in a way that is a pretty dramatic because the world for Democrats looks much different going into 2024 uh, if Biden is running than if he isn't. Right. I, I think the question really is, are Democrats preparing for that possibility? I think when you talk to uh, Democratic operatives, it's clear that there isn't a consensus around Vice President Kamala Harris as the heir uh, apparent to the nomination. You have to remember, Biden campaigned on the notion of uh, being a bridge to a new generation of Democratic leadership. Well, uh, you know, so far as it relates to the presidency, that new generation has not yet emerged. And so uh, I think if you look at that caveat, that he plopped into that question, uh, to that answer about 2024, I think, within the party, that the wheels should be turning uh, in order to deepen the bench. And I guess, Terry, the, the question is, if he's not going to run, when is a good time to announce that? I mean, LBJ, I think, is the last president we had who announced he wasn't running for re-election. He kind of stuck it at the end of his speech uh, on, on, the, on, on Vietnam. Uh, when, I mean, how, how do you make a decision like that? How do you suddenly come out? At what, when is a good time to declare that you're a lame duck? Well, exactly. That's the problem, as you point out. As late as possible for the president, as early as possible for the party and the other candidates. And I think Avery is exactly right. I think there's a pent-up demand in both parties and across the political spectrum, independents included, to begin the politics of tomorrow. Uh, like if we're going to get a rerun of, of 2020, if it's going to be Biden-Trump, a lot at stake, obviously, in that election. We may well get it. But I think the possibility of, of someone on either side being able to burst through on the simple claim that those politics are over and that it is time to move forward. I think one of the challenges that Biden has had as president is he seems to a lot of people to be an enervated executive. He, it is partly his age. It's partly that he, he hasn't seized hold of the issues that a lot of people are most concerned about. Uh, he's obviously behind the eight ball on testing and COVID. And I think people are eager for more energy in the executive and more youth as well. Look, we may not get it, but the first party that gets there has a huge advantage. And, uh, you know, for all the talk of a rematch of 2020, it's quite possible that neither man uh, is, is, is on the ballot uh, next time around. Speaking of the, the former president, uh, something struck me this week. Well, well two things. Uh, one was when he was asked uh, about uh, being vaccinated, and he acknowledged uh, that he had taken the booster and he got booed at an audience uh, that, that, that was listening to him with Bill O'Reilly. And then uh, this exchange that I want to play for you uh, from an interview he did with Candace Owens with The Daily Wire. Take a listen. And I came up with a vaccine, with three vaccines. Mm. All are very, very good. 
And, and yet we more say, people have died under COVID this year, by the way, yeah, under Joe Biden, right. than under you. And more people took the vaccine this year. So people are questioning how... Well, no, the vaccine worked, but yeah. some people aren't taking it. The ones, the ones that get very sick and go to the hospital are the ones that don't take the vaccine. People aren't dying when they take the vaccine. I mean, t t Terry, that was... First of all, I don't know where that Trump has been. I mean, the, the, this anti-vax movement has really grown among largely, not exclusively, but largely among uh, his supporters. Uh, but that was a direct pushback from the former president to this misinformation that is being peddled, frankly, by largely by his supporters. It, it, it's the most important event in public health in this country in a while, that, that President Trump who has a loyal following of tens of millions of people, is now telling them openly something he wasn't before. Take the vaccine. He's going beyond that. He's saying it's our vaccine. We can be proud. Our movement, the Trump movement, should own this vaccine. I think that is huge, as is President Biden's somewhat belated crediting of the work that was done in the Trump administration, the remarkable work that was done in the Trump administration to get this vaccine production stood up and going. I would say, though, that, that if you look closely at people who aren't getting the vaccines, yes, there are a lot of people who do it for ideological reasons, but the bottom line is people uh, of lower access to health care, lower education, lower income. It's people that we have trouble reaching with public health in general. Uh, the ideological resistance to vaccinations is making all of that worse. But this is, a, this is a challenge for public policy in a lot of areas. And the fact that Donald Trump and Joe Biden are now on the same page is a huge deal. That's a very good point. Uh, that, that there's also an issue of, of access still in this country, an issue of, of access. Uh, but, but Avery, I, I kind of wonder, I mean, Trump has never been anti-vax. I mean, he, he said that he took the vaccine. He's but he hasn't really spoken out or pushed back until, until this interview here. And, and I think back to when he himself was vaccinated, which happened when he was still president, uh, but it was something he didn't tell the world about. In fact, it, they didn't, nobody knew about it until about two months later. I wonder how different that kind of anti-vax movement among his supporters would be if he had gone out and publicly done what a lot of other political figures have done and said, look, here's a picture of me or video of me being vaccinated. Go out and get the vaccine. Right. I mean, look, I think that the former president has looked for credit uh, for Operation Warp Speed for uh, getting those vaccines uh, available to Americans as soon as uh, they could be. Uh, but the, the fact is that uh, the, the former president has sort of almost lost control of, of the narrative in this, in this respect. I think you're seeing here uh, the limits of his influence uh, on a, a factor and a, a subset of Americans uh, that are typically aligned with him. So even uh, when he comes out and he says he's been vaccinated, uh, you're still going to get that pushback from uh, portions of his base. So, so Rick, let, let's get back to the current president uh, who had a, a what seemed to be a major setback this week to his domestic agenda, obviously mostly in, in the person of Joe Manchin. Uh, Joe Manchin coming out and saying he is not in favor of, of Build Back Better. I, I noticed that when Biden was asked about this, he said... Uh, at one point that, uh, that, that Manchin had acknowledged to the uh, progressives on the Hill that he misled them, that Biden didn't mislead them, but that Manchin misled them. But that, what was he talking about? I, I, I don't know, John, because <laughs> no conversation like that took place, according to Manchin's office or the progressives. What I think is going on here, and I think the president alluded to this in the interview with David Muir, he's looking to, to find a way back into the negotiations. Uh, a week ago, they fell apart spectacularly with Manchin going on Fox News saying uh, that he was a hard no. The White House flamed him right back with a statement that suggested that he broke his word. Since then, we've seen President Biden try to dial that back and dial back the, the, the harsh words. That's not him. That's also not Joe Manchin. And I think there's a the shared commitment to trying to get pieces of Build Back Better done in the new year. Now, there's progressives who say we have to start at the same number that we had before. Anything less than that is unacceptable. I don't think they're recognizing the reality here. Manchin has made as clear as possible he's not budging. I think, though, what, what Biden is trying to do is to, to, to lay the groundwork for productive negotiations that can restart in the new year. Uh, everyone's temperature is going to be down just a little bit, and then they can start discussing that all over again. There's a lot of work that has to get done to get Manchin over the finish line. Uh, clearly, he didn't like the pressure campaign that was mounted by the White House and others. Uh, it's going to be on Biden to try to get things working again. Avery, what's, what's your sense? What's our reporting on just how caught by surprise uh, the, the White House was 
Uh, and frankly, Manchin's colleagues on, on the Hill as well, they, 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 they seemed to be stunned uh, when he went on and said that to, to Brett Baer on, on Fox News. Right. I, I think that uh, this caught folks by surprise. If you talk to folks within the White House, uh, uh, they did not think that he was going to go uh, onto Fox News and, and make a, a statement as scathing uh, as uh, he did. Uh, but look, I, it's no secret that Joe Manchin is often at odds with uh, members of his own party. He has been a consistent uh, spoiler of, of Democratic agenda items uh, for the past year. Uh, and so, look, when you, you look at these statements that he made, made, uh, the fact that he felt like he could not go back to West Virginia and uh, argue uh, in favor of uh, the Build Back Better social spending plan, that is not an indicator of, of negotiations uh, and a deal that's about to be struck. There's still a large gulf between uh, Manchin and other members of his party. Uh, and if the Democrats hope to get the Build Back Better uh, Act passed, uh, there's a lot more work to do. Yeah, and there was some reporting about what Manchin was saying uh, about how uh, the child tax credit would be used or was being used in West Virginia. What, what was that all about? Right. Uh, there were reported comments from uh, Senator Manchin uh, in which he privately uh, expressed concerns about uh, parents using the child tax credit payments to buy drugs or uh, if family paid leave uh, was uh, uh, initiated that uh, folks might use it or exploit it in order to uh, go deer hunting, uh, effectively, uh, you know, resurrecting the, the myth of the welfare queen, that Reagan era uh, trope. Uh, used to argue against entitlements, uh, implying that uh, the poorest among us are uh, inherently irresponsible and incapable of using government uh, services uh, for their intended purposes. Uh, and uh, that is such a glaring statement uh, that uh, outraged folks who heard it and, and illustrates just how out of step Senator Manchin is with this current Democratic Party. And, and as you know, Terry, he's from a state that uh, that. Biden only got, what was it, 30-some uh, percent in. Yeah, so he's got that to deal with. He does represent one of the poorest states in the union. He seems to represent the plutocrats a lot. But look, Manchin is just part of the problem. This is a hugely ambitious bill uh, to restructure health care, education, immigration, climate, all different kinds of things. The public in West Virginia and other, word, and other places focused on inflation, pandemic, crime, the border. All right, Terry, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you for the roundtable. We'll see you next year. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.